horrible. That's not underwhelming. That's horrible. <laughs> Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop here and... Matt Easton, Scholar Gladiatoria. And we're back for Weird Weapons. Weird Weapons again, because the last one we did on the flail, we really enjoyed. First of all, quick apology. I inadvertently, last time when I was holding up my blanket, did a teaser, did a clickbait. That wasn't what I was trying to do. I was genuinely trying to get you to give us ideas. But anyway, so I'm really sorry for that. But we are now back for the real unboxing. So. Or unblanketing. Unblanketing. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, go on. I love it. It's a pole axe. It's a, it's a whatever it's it is. It's a longsword pole axe, right. I don't know how many of you will have seen one of these before. I hadn't seen one at all. So I went to the British Museum, basically just looking at other stuff. And that was in the cabinet. And I have never seen it. And here it is behind me. The most amazing, well, pole axe they call it. I'm not entirely sure that it is, but it's an amazing object. And so for mm. years I'd been going to the British Museum looking at the arms and armour, and then one day I was wandering around some other, and I was like, whoa, what's that cool thing? I don't know what they're called. I don't yeah. know what they call them. Yeah, because the they call it a pole axe, and I don't, for me, that's not a pole axe. Do you, yeah, so. Uh, it's a pole axe like head. A, it's like a sword axe, yeah. a sword pole axe, yes. I don't know what to call them, but a couple of interesting things about them is, first of all, not weapons exactly like this, but weapons similar to this are shown in some manuscripts mm. um, where they look like a combination between a pole axe and a sword. Yeah. So a lot of people will be screaming Fury Delivery at the screen uh, because there is a sword axe type but thing it's not there. it's not quite the same it's not like this no mm. that's more of a specialized armored fighting sword um that it has a spiky cross guard and a spiky yeah. pommel so actually the back end becomes the pole axe but the other thing is there there is something uh, like this shown in a it's around from about 1400 if i remember correctly um manuscript which does have a sword hilt um, and the blade part, if we want to, the hitting part, if we want to call it that, is more like a uh, an axe blade yep. um, version with little spikes on it. Okay, so so what we need to know, first of all, Matt's been talking about 1400. I'm familiar with that uh, Fiore picture. Um, I think there might be something in Talhofer as well. I'm not, not certain. But the British Museum one is dated uh, 1649 to 53. And the reason they've dated it, that way is right here on the quillen block i have not done it on this repro but right there on the quillen block there's a silver panel and it's got the coat of arms of the commonwealth so when oliver cromwell was kicking around so that four-year period presuming that that wasn't added later on which it could have been i think it was yeah right okay yeah presuming it wasn't added later on absolutely dates it for that period. But what would this be doing in, in you know, the middle of the 17th century? It's just, it's, it, it, it's, it would be odd. It's form, it's design, you know, the, the pommel, the guard, the style of the pole axe, they don't, to me, they don't fit in the 1600s. That, that for me certainly, certainly doesn't as well. You might consider that the shaft would be hollow, but actually the way it's constructed, I think it can't be. So the thing is solid steel, top to bottom. Um, so it is going to be weighty. But the other thing, of course, is I didn't have access, full disclosure again, I didn't have access to the object out of the cabinet. Mm -hmm. So I spent a very freaky half an hour measuring it from outside the cabinet. It's quite close to the glass, but measuring it all the different proportions that I could and then getting photos and scalings on. I might have made some errors in that process. You know, I, I probably have in honesty. So it might be a bit heavier, might be a bit lighter might be bang on so on this on the surface of it my my suspicion is that especially if there's another one of these mm. that during the um during cromwell's kind of looting of various places that this and the other one if the other one does indeed exist um somewhere in the tower of london um were taken by cromwell and one of them had the commonwealth uh sort of emblem just graffitied it. it yeah basically mm. i think that they date to about um end of the end of the 1400s early 1500s mm. all right uh, cool. They've got to be specialised armoured fighting things, I would think. We'll set up a sandbag with a bit of plate on it and a bit of cushioning. Yeah, uh, and then fun. And then leg a lamb or something for that side. And we'll just have a look and <laughs> uh, see what kind of mess it makes. What we've got here is a, a hook. You might say, well, that's for suspension. But actually, point of gravity, it's, you know, oh. it's not. So I don't think it is for suspension, which is why wow. I have this. <laughs> so I have a blunt sword here. And I very strongly suspect it's for that. Because I cannot see it being for suspension. It's either to act as a bit of a guard or it's controlling. I'm, I might be, you know, again, cards on the table, I might be obsessed by the, the, the controlling factor of these hooks. 
because you see this sort of feature. <laughs> it's a sword breaker, brilliant. <laughs> when Matt and I were dealing with the flail, it was really interesting to have those guys sparring. So I'm going to make some sparring versions of this, <laughs> uh, and then I'll come visit you again, and we'll see. So I'll put those hooks on the sparring version as yeah. well, and we'll have a look at what happens. It's a really weird place to have that hook, isn't it? Because you think, why wouldn't you just attach it to the guard? It would and, and be an is, easier make. <laughs> and that is the point of balance. Um, but would you want to, I mean, to feel the weight of that? Could yeah, you really reasonably walk around with that? You know. no, I don't know. I mean, if it's for some kind of judicial duel, if it's some for, for, for a specific process where maybe they start off with spears, um, you know, we know that uh, certainly in Germany they had a system whereby you had a sort of three weapon set. So you had spear, sword, sword dagger, or poleaxe, sword, dagger. And so if this was somehow the second weapon and you had a primary weapon, and maybe that could hang, could, engage with something on the armour. Sorry, Matt, but... you, can't, you can't fight with that dangling off But you. the problem is the point of balance, isn't yeah. it? And, and like you say, we haven't had the one out of the cabinet in, in the British Museum. No, I, I think the point you're making, and I'm not going to make Matt make this because it could be read as an insult, is that I've got it wrong and the point of balance is incorrect. Uh, That's no, what well, you're thinking. No, 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 well, no, yeah, well, we, do, we okay. just don't know. But, but, but yeah. my point would be, is even if we move that down to here, the point of balance would be improved, but there's still so much length and mass there, it would still be swinging around. Even, even though it might not actually topple over, it would just be horrible. I mean, it is that thing that when something gets hit, it's going to stay hit. Oh, gosh, yeah. But it would not be my first choice to uh, pick I'm up looking out the forward armory. to seeing what this does to things. Hmm? <laughs> Should we find out? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's find out. I mean, it's heavy. It was, we just weighed it. Three and a half kilos, so seven and a half pounds. Yeah, so it's How similar. did it feel? It's similar to a full-size pole axe um, or a large two-handed sword. Um, so it's like one of those kind of pole arm length things, but in a smaller, heavier yeah. package. And it's a little bit like a light sledgehammer. Well, seven pounds, it's like a sledgehammer. Yeah. It is actually like a sledgehammer. Yeah, but the balance completely different yeah. because of course yeah. the weight, weight on a sledgehammer is up at the head, but whereas oh, really? this is, is the whole thing. But I can't really conceive how that matters in terms of power delivery. Because in the head, obviously, you have all of the momentum in the head. And here you have actually relatively, probably 10, 15%, 10% yeah. of the weight of this is the head. Yeah, and the rest well, is the whole object. Absolutely, and the fact that you've got a big solid pommel there and across a not insubstantial mm. cross guard in the middle suggests to me that this is intended to be turned around yeah you know the other thing to say about it is it's basically indestructible isn't it there is no wooden shaft here there's it's it is genuinely i wouldn't actually say that no and the reason is there is an account somewhere where they talk about the head being hardened okay the problem with medieval steels and through hardening is something like that. It's really quite difficult, actually, on yeah. the whole. So you might be able to get a bit of hardness in the spikes. This one I haven't. I've just gone with mild steel. Okay. Um, most of the mass impact weapons of the period are not hardened. That said, again, the rest of it I've done in mild steel. I'm guessing it was probably really in wrought. I doubt it was genuinely completely in steel. So mm. I suspect that if you gave it everything, yeah. you would be able to bend the shaft on that. Bend it rather than... I guess the original could have had hardened steel tips. Really difficult. That is nice and thin, yeah. and you could harden that, yeah. and you, then you could draw it back with the temper. Yeah. That spike would be really a difficult thing in, in the medieval period to harden that fully. You could case harden it, perhaps, but mm -hmm. you might make a hole in a bit of mild steel, but yeah. you know that you're not... I mean, how far has that got to go in before it hurts somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of the actual penetration? And that's going to be, what, inch and a half, two inches? It's going to be up to the shaft. It can't, it can't go through armour enough yes. to really prick the person um, inside. I mean, here's another thought. Actually, these weapons come around in the age of plate, mm. where actually most surfaces you're striking are not going to be male. They're going to be plate yep. or padded Edges armor, of plate. Brigandine. Or... Yeah, so maybe these are more effective in that era than they would have been earlier on male. Well, i tell you what, I've got a bit of brig as well. So, um, yeah. right, let's get it out. Let's have a look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared, and you're, you're going to realise why in a minute. For our first test, we have a brigandine sample, Corazina, uh, same thing, um, from Ash, actually. Ash, uh, Armour Services Historical. So we've used that before in my Lockdown Longbow films, and here we go. But 
I think I'm going to have to support this target. So, Matt, give it your everything. I don't think you can do that. Oh, I can, oh, come on. Okay. What we got? All right. It did not penetrate the plates. But again, if you look at that <laughs> there, you want blunt force trauma? <laughs> you got blunt force trauma. Well, go for one something more or less on the spine or, or, up, the or up here, okay. and we'll go again. I can tell you, if you were in that, I don't care if it went through or not, if you were in that, you were in big trouble. I mean, again, that's, it's broken your back. It's, you're out of the battle. But you know what I was saying yeah. about bending the shaft? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you really are a man. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Well, I mean, that's, that is, that is so we noticed. know, that is the thinnest point is a 15 millimeter steel bar. Which shows I'm hitting it fairly hard then. Well, you're not pretending, yeah. <laughs> so what I say is we go straighten it, and then yeah. we go for that side on here. Yeah, okay. And we'll have a look. Yeah. Just <laughs> look at that. So, Matt, this is, this is the one that you just struck it there where you actually bent the hammer, and I yeah. mean, look at that. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a huge amount of focused force going to that steel. Yeah. sheet there and you can see it's getting close to mm. sort of stretching around there isn't it you can yeah. see exactly where the points hit and that was the earlier one which wasn't quite as uh, quite as hard and in fact mm. this this plate was more bent to begin with and i think the second hit kind of straightened <laughs> that top one out right i think we should be all right for me to stand here because i really want to see this so go for the coronel matt <laughs> yeah i should have been there shouldn't i <laughs> where did that where did that hit Oh, oh, in fact, actually, you know exactly where it is. Oh, hits. wow. <laughs> it's like a tattoo, isn't it? What's the deformation on the inside like, Matt? So, not as much, but there is certainly, there is certainly some. I mean, that plate's uh, taken most of the force, I think, from one, one of mm. the prongs, uh, which is that one there. You'll be pleased to know that the, the mighty Matt Easton bent the shaft again. In the other, in the other direction. In the other direction. Uh, which... Again, it, it becomes an interesting thing because one of two things is happening is either in reality, you know, back 600 years ago, the shafts could bend. That's one thing. And it doesn't, it's not necessarily not true because actually it's still a viable weapon. So and you just straighten after the battle. The other one is that they were making them out of steel shafts. Mm. Um, and that could be the case. So in that sense, you know, we've learned a little bit of something there. Uh, or maybe for every heavy hit with one direction, you make sure you give a heavy <laughs> hit with the other direction. Of course. <laughs> I, was, I was just saying to Todd off camera, I think that I always thought of these steel shafted weapons as the kind of heavier but um, indestructible versions of the wooden shafted cousins of them. But actually, a wooden shaft's not going to bend, is no, it? No, it'll spring back. It's much more resilient in yeah. that sense. And I know that some metal shafted uh, maces were hollow mm. with wood inside yeah uh, so they're a tube essentially with with a wooden shaft yeah. up the center um with this one though it's too thin to, for that to be the case i think isn't it, it? it's too thin the hollow shaft also tapers so you'd actually need two wooden plugs which would leave you a really oh, weak right. bit in the middle the other thing is because of the way it's constructed you can see on the original there's a bit of leather that's broken away there okay. so you can see it's a slab tank coming through oh, right. and then you have the spike at the top here okay. i've actually ended up brazing it yeah. um brazing and riveting mm -hmm. but they just riveted through here mm -hmm. and so again um unless they welded in which they could have done welded in a stub here and actually and welded in a stub there they could have done it yeah. but you would have it's a it's it's a technically quite a challenging thing yeah. to save actually very little of the mass if you were going to do it. Yeah. So I am, I'm sure it's solid all the way. I'd, I'm really curious what that oh, okay. might do with a half sawing type stab to right. that armour. Well, I think I'm going to hold it again this time. Okay. Right, go for it. Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. It's gone through. So it has gone through. It's the only one which has gone through. <laughs> but, huge story. So it's gone through six millimetres. It is that thing that it's just not going to well, barely draw blood. Probably wouldn't draw again. blood. Yeah, go again. Oh, you are hitting that, so, so that one actually hit a, hit a nail. All right, so well, let's go again. There we go. But again, yeah. 
It's even, through your undergarments, it's not going to even draw blood, I think. In Fiori Delibri's treatise, he talks about the point of a poleaxe and he says, with a good thrust, this might go through a Corazina. Well, technically, that has gone through it a has. Corazina. <laughs> so it may not incapacitate someone or even badly wound them. What really surprises me is that that half sword thrust is able to go through when on paper you'd think the accelerated leverage of a swing would have more effect. I'm going to take a stab in the dark. Sorry, that's a really bad joke, not intended. <laughs> I'm going to take a stab in the dark, Matt. And when you're swinging, actually what, what you've got is all of that area yeah. of momentum is not working for you. It's working subtracting from that because you're pivoting around that point or okay. a lot of it in a way, okay. not necessarily around that point. But you have the mass here, which is coming through, but a lot of this mass is not behind it. Yeah. When you're half sorting, yeah. everything you've got and my body is behind it. Yeah. And I think that's what the difference is. Yeah. Or maybe my, I mean, which I, is interesting, actually. I hadn't considered that. I, yeah. I, and we should also say this is just me swinging this thing. I'm sure there are bigger, stronger people who can swing this with more force than me. But that being said, the fact that I bent the shaft in both well, every time I swung it, basically, hmm. suggests that I'm hitting it fairly hard. <laughs> well, if you keep doing that, it'll harden up quite soon. <laughs> Let's get our leg of lamb out. Cool. and see what mess we can make of that. Yeah. So we're back with the leg of lamb now, and I think coronel strike sort of at a bit of an angle to see what yeah. would happen to your arm or your what leg, really. What does a coronel do to flesh? I don't honestly know. Sort of unimpressive. Oh, okay. That's quite interesting. Separated the flesh from the bone, I take it back. It might look underwhelming on the outside, just those four little holes but the entire front face of that hammer has gone into the meat up to there. Yeah, I don't know, it, it, it sort of looks a bit underwhelming, but why don't you give it a go with the main spike? <laughs> that's horrible. That's not underwhelming. That's horrible. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. that's horrible. Okay. And that's a big That's hole. a big it's hole. It's not like a little And I think... Tidy. You know, I'm not a trauma medic, but my guess here as well is that not only have you got puncture wound, you've got a hell of a mess around the puncture wound. Huge surface area of bleeding mm. wound, yeah. Mm. So I, I think, Matt, that we can both agree that that is not underwhelming. It's a horrific, great, square, bloody hole. <laughs> and, and the only thing that stopped it was the brigandine underneath. Yeah. Well, and, and the shaft, I guess. I mean, I, that... Yeah. I hate to say it, it penetrated up to the shaft. <laughs> There's no arguing. That's with his that department. Really, is there? Clearly, if you're wearing uh, no armour, go the other way. Uh, Brigandine, you're still going to be in one hell of a mess, aren't you? you I know? think it's also worth mentioning as well clothes. I mean, layers of clothes are, are well known to stop um, cutting and slashing mm. to some extent, but but they're never going to stop a swung spike. <laughs> no. Or a shot spike. No, they might stop it going through, but I think that's the thing. You, you know, you mu you mustn't confuse the fact that something doesn't go through the armour to the fact that it makes a hell of a mess on the other yeah. side of the armour. So you take it away, do what you want with it, and I'll meet up in a few weeks with some sparring versions awesome. and, uh, and we'll have a look. And we'll find out if my... I have got such a fixation about these being trapping hooks. We'll find out if that really is what it's about. All right, thank you very much, guys. Cheers. <laughs>